Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan and welcome once again to the Vast and Ominous Comic Book Vault. It's time to go in a new acquisitions for this week. We've got six brand new books for you and of course at the very end we'll also have a segment of things Captain Logan doesn't read with Dan. Right now, let's jump right into our first DC book of the day. Uh, you know, usually I start with Marvel. I thought today I'd mix things up and bookend the show with DC. Let's start off with Action Comics number 15 by Grant Morrison. Finally, a lot of this uh, five-dimensional stuff is starting to really come together, and we're learning more and more about how the Mixelplex stuff fits into what's been going on in action. Uh, this stuff has been a bit convoluted and also in the background and confusing as to what exactly is going on. Lots and lots of revelations going on. This is a key, key issue for what's been going on with the series, uh, if you've been following it at all. And uh, these villains that uh, are all powered by different colors of kryptonite are back, and the book is really uh, uh, dealing with their threat of Superman on a grand scale over a long history that is known by Mrs. Nixley. Now, uh, without giving too much away, we finally figure out where Mixelplick himself fits in. And of course, we've been kind of waiting to see him. I don't recall... Uh, even a mention of him so far, uh, if if there was, I've, I I don't remember it. But certainly, uh, we haven't had um, you know you know really a big appearance by him yet. And what's really odd and and kind of uh, and kind of awkward uh, intentionally is that. All of this stuff about the five dimension are, are all things that are going to happen later that Miss Nixley knows about, and uh, she, you know, it has a lot of the problems that you always have with precognition things, where she can read the future and she's come to uh, Superman early to tell him things that he's not supposed to know about yet for the future, but will inform his decisions later on, and yet she doesn't seem to have full control of what she's allowed to tell him. There's also, there's also this weird um, deal with like three wishes where she's she's allowed to have three wishes and uh, like a genie and except that she has them for herself and uh, can use them to make anything happen whatsoever and it's questionable as to when she uses them and, and why and why she's not able to do certain things that it seems like she should be able to do. Anyway, uh, with, without without uh, spoiling some major stuff, um, I can't really go any further into that. But uh, it, it is it is a bit convoluted, and it is it is kind of confusing uh, because it's like, well, why exactly uh, is she able to do certain things if she knows the future, um, but not others? It's like she can't affect things enough. You, you also sort of wonder um, if she is still a full imp from the fifth dimension, or if she's now made totally human with still some uh, extra peripheral powers for some reason. Uh, you do definitely get that sense with the backup feature in this book, which I won't go into, um, that uh, that goes into the history of Mixelplik. And so that's all really interesting. I gotta say that Mixelplik is handled with more reverence here than I've ever seen from Grant Morrison, and it, it, it's like Grant Morrison really loves the fifth dimension, and he treats it like it's the best thing in Superman, and almost convinces me of, uh, maybe not of that, but but that it's worth uh, uh, taking as much time with as, as, as he's doing. Um, some of the mythology from the Fifth Dimension, the way Morrison's doing it, is fascinating. This Gold and Silver Age kind of stuff is what he likes to really run with and really expound upon and find ways to tell serious stories with kind of silly, goofy things. He keeps them silly, but he also finds ways to make a compelling narrative out of it. And Mixelplik is, and, and, and Nixley are uh, uh, kind of touching characters the way he handles them. Um, the, the, the way, I, I hope no one will mind me mentioning, uh, giving this away, but the way he he, uh, he handles them is uh, Nixley in the Fifth Dimension is a princess and is actually um, kind of Mixelplik's bride, which is which is fascinating. Anyway, um, I really enjoyed this. Like I said, it's convoluted. I don't know if you can do the Fifth Dimension not being convoluted. Uh, an another idea I really liked is how uh, the fifth dimension is on such a different plane of existence than our dimension that even saying certain words uh, from it are powerful enough to hurt people. Uh, 
I think I think that's really interesting. Uh, there's some great stuff in this comic. Uh, maybe my uh, favorite since the first arc. Uh, so I would uh, I would recommend that one. I really enjoyed it. Uh, next up, Avengers number one from Marvel now. Jonathan Hickman and uh, Jerome Opena, who uh, is not a name I immediately recognize. Um, perhaps I've read some things from him and just don't remember it, but I've got to say the artwork in this is absolutely astounding. So whoever this guy is, I'm really glad that they got him. Uh, this is so classic looking. It's classic and it's classy, and I loved every moment of reading this comic book. Uh, premise wise, there's something that I'm really wondering about, and I'm sure that that uh, this will become clear as the series progresses. And that is, when exactly is this set? Is this now or is this older? Because basically, this book sets up the idea of Avengers expansion of we have a small team of heroes that is Earth's mightiest heroes that's supposed to save the day when we have major threats. And the threats are increasing and it's getting worse and worse. And Captain America and Iron Man put their heads together and say, we need to get bigger. We, we've got to expand the Avengers. And that's been happening for years. And of course, Hickman can't be unaware of that. The cover has a lot of different characters that we know have been in, in the Avengers, and in fact, um, if you look at my monitor back here, uh, we see the first three covers put together make one big picture, which I think is really cool. I, I love that. I, it, it's also more of an incentive to buy the first three issues. And um, this begins, uh, oddly, with the uh, same Avengers team from the movie. So, uh, you know, you know, Black Widow, Hulk, Iron Man... Um, Hawkeye, Thor, Captain America. Um, it, it's it's uh, it, it's really kind of surprising, and they sort of treat it like they've been together a while, and now they're thinking about expanding. What I'm hoping this turns out to be is like an explanation for why they finally started uh, increasing their ranks like crazy, like they have been. Like maybe this is an untold story. I've not read up on this, I've not read any uh, interviews with Hickman or anything, so I might be totally off base, but if this is supposed to be current and is keeping and, and is keeping up with everything that's happened in the past, it completely ignores the fact that this expansion thing has been going on for a while. So, so I kind of wonder, I also um, sort of made the assumption while I was reading it that part of the reason for the art style and for it looking classic like it does is because it kind of takes place in the past. Now. If that's the case, I also can't help but wonder what Black Widow's doing there and why it's sort of treating... It doesn't come out and say this, but it sort of treats it like the movie Avengers team is the original Avengers, which, of course, it's not, and it would be a complete retcon to pretend like it is. Um, I'm not saying that this is pretending that, because it, it certainly doesn't come out and say that, but it's like this idea of getting as many superheroes involved on a global scale of, uh, with the Avengers is a totally new idea. Uh, so, anyway, um, I, I, I am wondering about that, and I'm sure it will become clear over time. Um, if you like Fantastic Four, if you like what Hickman was doing on that book, you will absolutely love this. It's the same kind of writing, and, um, kind of some of the same sort of ideas. Uh, I, I don't want to get too much into it, um, with, with, besides just mentioning the, the, the expansion idea, and that the art is absolutely brilliant, and, um, there's an interesting villain plot, uh, but... Yeah, that's that's all I'm gonna mention about it. Um, get this, it's great. Okay, uh, next up for Marvel, Avenging Spider-Man number fifteen. Um, I bought this because, well, <laughs> okay, part part of the reason that I immediately uh, picked picked this issue up off the shelf and started looking at it is because I have this thing for dinosaurs <laughs> um, on covers. I don't know why, but if I find a dinosaur in a comic book, I am uh, almost immediately compelled to get it just on the principle of dinosaurs and comics are cool. Um, is that weird? Yes, it is. Uh, but that's that's just me. Um, then I purchased the comic when I found when I discovered. Well, he, it's a giant red dinosaur. Must be devil dinosaur with Spider Man. That's fun. And guess who wrote it? Cullen Bunn. Now uh, I did an interview with Cullen Bunn uh, the first time I talked to him. I've, I've talked to him a few times. The first time I talked to Cullen Bunn was like a year ago, and I 
um, asked him the question, if you could write any more obscure comic book character that uh, isn't used very often, who would you go to? And one of his big answers was Devil Dinosaur. And he talked about how much he loves that character and how he was hoping that at some point he'd get to write him. There he is in Avenging Spider-Man. And guess what? This is fun. This is a... Uh, this is just a romp in the Savage Land with uh, Spider-Man and Devil Dinosaur and Devil Dinosaur's sidekick because uh, Devil Dinosaur needs someone to interpret for him because he doesn't speak English. Um, uh, his, 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 uh, his primate sidekick, uh, Moon Boy, um, they, they all are fighting against a mad scientist that is, uh, trying to create more, di more, uh, kind of evil dinosaurs. And, uh, it's just really fun escapist stuff with a really lighthearted, uh, Spider-Man that has a, just a really, a really great voice, uh, a lot of comedy here. My, my favorite bit in this whole, uh, thing, I, I love, I love this line, is when Spider-Man says, you know... I would have made a great mad scientist. Uh, I love that. Anyway, uh, check this out. And issue 14, which I didn't read, uh, actually set this, sets this up. This is a two-parter. And uh, I think that the situation is given to us plainly enough at the beginning uh, without too much obnoxious exposition. Uh, in fact, no obnoxious exposition. The exposition is, is, uh, is uh, quite, um, quite quick and um, fast-paced. And uh, tells us everything we need to know, and so uh, you can read this all by itself if you want to. Um, I love this, fantastic. Okay, um, Daredevil End of Days number three. Uh, if you like Daredevil and you're not reading this, you need to be reading this. Uh, as I've said before, this is uh, Ben Urich trying to investigate the death of Matt Murdock, and boy, has he hit a roadblock here. The last word that Matt Murdock said when he died as Daredevil killed by Bullseye was Maypone. And he's been going around trying to figure out what that means and trying to find anybody connected to Matt Murdock's life who might know what that means. Here he finds uh, three different women all who were at some point romantically involved with Matt Murdock, all who led very violent lives at, at one point, uh, and, and most importantly, during the time that they were with Matt, and all who have moved on from that life and don't want to be reminded of it. Uh, that is the thematic, con the thematic connection between these women, and uh, it's absolutely fascinating. We see Electra, we see um, Typhoid Mary, who uh, no longer, of course, uh, has the, the personality of Typhoid Mary, and Echo. And uh, one of the uh, coolest and most nuanced idea in, in, in this is uh, toward the end where Echo actually uh, directly relates her handicap of being deaf to Matt's handicap of be being blind, and it's, 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 uh, it's really well done. Uh, one of the things that um, I really, really enjoyed about this book, too, is the artwork and how uh, it, it, it's, differ it's differentiated between the present-day stuff and the flashbacks. And there, there are these uh, very short flashbacks, but, are, but which are given to us uh, in, in these, uh, in these uh, wonderfully dramatic and beautiful two-page spreads uh, of, of um, painted artwork. And uh, it's absolutely beautiful. It reminds me of a period, and I want to say it was kind of like late 90s, early 2000s of, of, of Daredevil, um, that I wasn't reading but flipped open and looked at a couple issues and, and didn't really care for the art because it, it looked... Um, a little bit too abstract for my taste. And if this whole book looked like that, I'd have kind of a difficult time telling what was going on. Seeing it in flashback, just as artwork, my goodness, it's gorgeous. Uh, take a look. This is uh, this is a wonderful book. And um, we've got uh, Klaus Janssen doing the pencils here. And um, Bill Sankiewicz does uh, the finished art and uh, those, those, paint, those paintings. And then uh, Mac doing the painted pages. Um, get this. My goodness, it's good. Uh, last thing for Marvel this week, we've got all new X Men number three. What? All new X Men number three? Did we just do all new X Men number two last week? Yes, we did. I have no idea why this is already out. I didn't look it up, but here it is. Um, so, this issue opens up with us going to uh, Cyclops' new team of X Men, which. Uh, of course, I, I, I would assume that the uh, regular group of X-Men would not call them X-Men because they're kind of seeing them as the villains right now, which is very interesting. Um, Cyclops and Magneto are working together um, to... Uh, to uh, try to create a new world for mutants, and um, they, they see it as a revolution. 
and the uh, regular X-Men plus the original five who have come back in time to the present uh, don't like that idea. Now, this entire issue up until the very, very end uh, doesn't include uh, the, the past or the present X-Men. It's all Cyclops' team, and it's basically, a lot of it is an argument um, about whether or not Cyclops can be blamed for a lot of the things that he did and a lot of the people he hurt during AVX, especially, of course, Professor X, because now he's trying to argue that um, a lot of that was the Phoenix and that he had no control, which uh, I like that the book doesn't just let him get away with that because Magneto kind of calls the huge BS on him over it, and uh, it's 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 really interesting. Anyway, um, this is a, a, a lovely uh, book. I, I I love I love the artwork. It's 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 astounding. It's very dramatic and um, it's very dynamic. And uh, we've we've got um, Cyclops dealing with all of those characters that he was uh, having to deal with back in, in AVX when he had the uh, Phoenix power, and what's uh, in, including Emma Frost, and we finally see her again. What's really interesting is apparently the Phoenix Force has messed with their powers, and they don't work like they're supposed to. They're faulty. They go off when they're when they're not supposed to. And one of the things that Cyclops has has to uh, um, has to cope with is that he feels like he did back when he first discovered he had powers where he can't control them and you know he spent years learning how to control it now it's right back to where it was and oddly it's affecting Magneto even though he wasn't one of the Phoenix Five because uh, apparently because of the fact that uh, Cyclops was involving him in in the Phoenix stuff. Uh, I don't. I'm fuzzy on the details there. If he gave him some kind of extra powers or what exactly happened there. Uh, but even Magneto is being affected by this. Um, some people have more power. Some people have less. Uh, it's a very interesting revelation, and I'm really kind of happy that we got this here because I would have expected all of that stuff in. Uh, the new Uncanny X-Men book that, that, that hasn't started yet. Uh, but no, we get it here, uh, which is which is fabulous. Um, so anyway, uh, great new issue. Really surprised to get it so quickly. Uh, but um, Bendis' writing is uh, on up to, to uh, regular awesome Bendis par, and um, Stuart and Monin, uh, fantastic artwork for him. And now let's go to Dan and look at some things that Captain Logan doesn't read. It's time once again for things Captain Logan doesn't read with Dan. And uh, the first book we're going to be taking a look at today is a book that I got just to sort of see how interesting it would it was and review it on the show because I knew Captain Logan wasn't going to get this and I had a buy three get one free coupon for my comic book store, so I figured if I'm not going to pay for it, might as well try Thunderbolts number one. Uh, I was not anticipating this one at all because of the creative team. I'm not a big fan of Daniel Way and I'm not a huge Steve Dillon fan. I'm kind of indifferent towards him. Um, but I, my problem with this issue right off the bat is I really didn't get any new information from what I read here other than what's on the cover. I could have looked at the cover and everything about this issue that Daniel Way was going to tell me, uh, I, I could have saved a lot of time, basically. Uh, all you really know about the team after reading this is who's on the team, and, and that's it. Uh, we get General Ross, who's leading the new Thunderbolt squad, talking to the Punisher about how... The people he chose to join the new team understand uh, that killing people is a necessity sometimes, uh, that that's the only safe course of action in some situations, and um, he felt that uh, the people they recruited were the best to help him achieve his goals. Uh, all of the, the characters except the Punisher get a one or two page introduction that do nothing to tell us anything about the characters. They're pretty bland, there's not really any voice to them. Uh, all we learn about them is that they kill people, which I could have learned from looking at the cover anyway. <laughs> Um, like I said, the book, it feels like it thinks the novelty of superheroes killing people is unique and intriguing enough to warrant its existence. Uh, when Marvel's going to be publishing three other books about superheroes that kill people, uh, with Secret Avengers, Cable, and the X-Force, as well as Uncanny X-Force. It's not a unique concept just within Marvel's current publishing line, let alone the history of comics. So, the novelty was a little lost on me. It's not that I'm uninterested in the premise of this book, it's just that I'm not sure what it is other than superheroes killing people, so I'm not sure if I'm interested. Um, Dylan's artwork isn't cringeworthy like his most recent foray into Avenging Spider-Man was for me. I really didn't like his art there, uh, but his style fits the material of this much better, obviously, and uh, the only problem I really have with him is his characters still do look a bit similar in places for my tastes, but what are you going to do? Uh, he did draw some pretty good action, so i got to give him credit there. 
Um, overall, I wouldn't really recommend Thunderbolts number one. It, it wasn't really my cup of tea. It's just sort of violence for the sake of violence, and uh, it doesn't really have any identity, so I wouldn't really recommend this. Next, we have a book that I was highly requested to review on the last show, um, and I hadn't been reviewing it because I was sort of disappointed uh, with the premise and the direction of the book, and, and the quality as well. I, I didn't think it was up to um, the quality that it had, it had been at one point. But anyway, we have The Amazing Spider-Man number 699. Uh, this continues the premise that began last issue with Doc Ock uh, stealing Peter Parker's body. Uh, the issue is mostly exposition fitting together all the pieces of Doc Ock's scheme so that we know how it all went down, uh, which I was grateful for because I thought they were just going to leave it unexplained uh, after what Doc Ock said in the previous issue. Um, before I move on, I have to give some credit where credit's due. Um, I do find this concept to be really interesting. Uh, Slot has some nice parallels between Peter, uh, Dr. Octopus, Morbius, and the Lizard here about how men of science are classically condemned for defying natural law, and that worked really well with the body-swapping sci-fi premise that he's going with here. Um, Peter and some of the other characters do have some dialogue that seemed a bit out of character to me. Uh, with the Peter moment continuing problems that I had with his character post Ends of the Earth, but they weren't detrimental to the story this time, and I can't really talk specifics about what sort of things I had a problem with without spoiling the events of this issue, so I don't really want to say much more. Uh, Ramos didn't really have any cringeworthy moments f for me here, which was a pleasant surprise. Uh, so. Overall, I'm enjoying this arc a bit more than previous slot stuff, but I've learned to be extremely cautious with investing myself in a slot Spider-Man story because he's written great arc openers before, uh, only to have it fly off the rails completely and utterly by the end for me. So we'll see how uh, it ends when 700 hits the sands and see if it makes or breaks it. But until then, I'm kind of enjoying this. It's decent. Uh, Next up, we have Star Wars The Purge Tyrant's Fist, number one, the first in a two-issue miniseries from Dark Horse. This one's by Alexander Freed, with art by Marco Castiello and Andrea Cella. It's two artists doing the art on this. And um, this one focuses on post-Revenge of the Sith Darth Vader hunting down Jedi who survived Emperor Palpatine's Order 66 when it was enacted in Revenge of the Sith. Uh, the plotting of this book didn't really excite me. It doesn't really present anything intriguing other than the premise that Darth Vader's killing a Jedi who's, or attempting to kill a Jedi who's proving to be stubborn. Uh, but I really did enjoy the characterization. That sort of saved this for me. Uh, Vader's a bit more headstrong and short-sighted than we've seen him in other places within the Star Wars timeline. His rage and pain are a bit fresher because of his recent turn to the dark side spurred by Padme's death in, in the film. Um, it stays away from all that prequel baggage with Vader, except for what it absolutely has to do to fit into this era. Um, let me put it this way, it uses the events of the prequel films to inform the characterization and then moves forward. Uh, it's completely accessible because of that as well, and I really enjoyed that. Uh, it, it's not... Basically, it's not Vader just moping about Padme the whole issue, and I really like that about it, because I've seen uh, post-Revenge of the Sith Vader handled like that, and, I, and it was refreshing to see him not like that here. Um, it also asks some logical questions about this Vader, like whether or not he's capable of co-governing an empire, or is he just the Emperor's thug. Um, it's a logical place to take Vader's character within this era, I think. So, uh, Overall, uh, I thought it was a pretty good first issue, and I can't wait to see how it get gets tied up next issue. There's a lot of questions and character things raised here. I, I, I want to see if they're able to pull it off in just two issues. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. And... Um, the last thing we have here is Hawkeye number five. This one is by Matt Fraction and Javier Polito. Um, and Hawkeye number five concludes the arc that began in the previous issue called The Tape. Uh, it's got this nice Bond-esque international espionage romp vibe going on. That's basically what the premise of the, this arc is. 
uh, with Hawkeye trying to get a tape back for S.H.I.E.L.D. that has video footage of a crucial political assassination on it. Um, I've been really enjoying this so far. It's a bit more like what I expected this book to be, uh, rather than the really grounded, everyday, heroic stuff that we got in the previous issues. Seeing as Hawkeye's a S.H.I.E.L.D. spy in the film continuity now, I figured they would have made this book completely that. Um, it's nice to get a story that's sort of like that. Um, Fraction continues to have a great voice for Hawkeye here, uh, making him a guy we want to root for because of his absolute commitment to seeing justice done. Uh, even though he's this headstrong, overconfident, womanizing guy who relies solely on his skills and intuition and nothing else. Um, he's not really a thinker, um, but, but he's a really easy guy to root for because of the things he believes in. I, I really like that Fraction has a good handle on the character. Um, the ending of the arc was pretty satisfactory. I thought it reiterates uh, a few things from Hawkeye's character that were brought up in the previous issues. Um, and it brings he and Kate Bishop closer together uh, by the end, too. So I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, Polito did a fine job with the issue. Um, he's not the usual artist on this book, for those who don't know, but he's got a style that's very old-school Marvel, uh, and he reminded me of John Romita Jr. in parts, while in other parts he seemed to be channel channeling Ditko a little bit. So uh, I was happy to see someone with those um, sort of sensibilities uh, coming in and filling in for AHA, because he's sort of the same way. Um, a little bit more of a classic minimalistic style rather than ultra detailed uh, like we've seen with a lot of Marvel's ar Marvel artists recently. Um, unfortunately he's not David Aha who makes this book even more of an enjoyable read uh, but he's no slouch and he did a great job here. I'd recommend this one as well. So that's all the books I have for you guys this week and uh, I hope you enjoyed my reviews and I should be back next week with more things that Captain Logan did not read. Let's take a look at Jason's pick for the week very briefly. Today we're going to look at Batman Detective Comics number 15. This is what Jason picked off the shelf. Uh, he said, Daddy Batman, and I said, all right, let's do it. Uh, this was a lot of fun. This is uh, John Lehman. And I and I, I I've been told um, though I didn't look this up that, that this is uh, his debut excuse me his debut issue on the book and uh, I think I think he's great for Batman I really enjoyed this uh, th this is a pretty good uh, what do you call it detective story for Batman uh, he actually does has to do some decent legwork and uh, it's the it's the kind of thing that only Batman can figure out we've got Clayface and Poison Ivy seeming to be married what. Uh, we've got Poison Ivy buried alive by the Penguin. What? Uh, we've got the Joker manipulating things behind the scene because behind the scenes because this is all part of Death of the Family, and I don't want to give anything away about how all that wraps up and what exactly is going on. But um, there is a really interesting reveal at the end of a new character that's kind of uh, up against the Penguin and trying to take over the Penguin's um, the Penguin's empire. And uh, this was all kinds of fun. Uh, do you need this for Death of the Family? No, you really don't. Uh, it actually sets up Batman 14 with uh, how the Penguin factors into that into that story. And uh, like I said, the Joker's not featured here, but he is. Uh, his presence is looming. I'll just say that. I don't like the fact that this has the exact same cover as uh, the first issue of Batman from Death of the Family. What's that about? The Joker is barely even in this issue, and uh, I don't know why they felt the need to put that on there. It feels like almost a mistake. I don't know why they did that. Um, considering the fact that we've got Clayface and Poison Ivy teaming up in this, uh, I would have... I, I felt very disappointed not to get some kind of neat Clayface Poison Ivy cover. So, uh, anyway, that's my only criticism of this. Otherwise, this is a really fun read. Um... Anyway, thanks everybody for watching the Comic Book Vault, and if you'd ever like to send anything for me or Vince to review on the Vault, you can always send that to our P.O. Box. That's Geek Solution, P.O. Box 14183, Lenexa, Kansas 66285. Thanks as always for watching. I'm Captain Logan, and happy reading.